be here, everyone, and I will just pass on to Olga, who will introduce our guest. Hello, everyone, um, <clears throat> and uh, welcome. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start by congratulating Lili Markaki for and the team of our amazing PhD students for organizing the series and the specific event. It's really no small achievement. You deserve a round of applause. <laughs> and um, also my thanks goes uh, go to the funders, the School of Performing and Digital Arts and the University of London <clears throat> that made it possible. It is my great uh, pleasure to introduce Cornelia Zolfrank. Uh, Cornelia is an artist whose importance uh, to the history of digital art and feminist art is hard to overestimate. Her name is associated with cyber feminism, which for those of you who don't know, um, was a mo movement of thinking and doing things about and with technology and gender that emerged in the early 90s and that was specifically grounded in rejecting the idea that technology is absolutely an a priori subsumed and sub subservient to the male white logic of the colonizer. Uh, Cornelia has her own critique now of that period and she's developing her thinking about techno-feminism uh, of what the most recent example is this book, The Beautiful Warriors, um, Techno-Feminist Praxis in the 21st Century. Uh, it's published in 2020 and as a lot of her work uh, is open access, so you can um, find it online. So the feminism, feminism was important for shifting the terms of the debate about women and technology and redrawing a system of coordinates away from the idea of simply widening participation for women in male systems to the development of a range of notions that made new systems with a different genealogy formed around different concepts. This of course requires not only making uh, things, objects, art projects, but developing infrastructures, platforms, organizations, communities. So Cornelia as an artist, net artist, software artist, feminist artist, has dedicated a substantial amount of her time to such collective art platforms. In 1992, she was a founding member of uh, an artist group, um, Women and Technology, Women Artist Group. In 1993, she was a founding member of um, Women Artist Group called Inan, of which I have a, a mouse oh, pad wow. <laughs> on my table. <laughs> Inan, which is inside, and here you can see Cornelia right here. <laughs> 30 um, years younger. <laughs> um, and um, in 1997, uh, there was an old boys network, an international cyber feminist alliance, of course, whose ethos was against the idea of founding members, but to which Cornelia's energy and talent is essential. As her own website states, a thematic priority of Zolfrank's work lies in the creation of forms of organization and communication structures as artistic practices. She works to support the development of critical internet culture in Germany. She founded ECO, the mailing list for art, criticism, and cultural politics, and was co-founder and editor of the online magazine for art and criticism, The Thing. In what is invariably a very short introduction to celebrate Cornelia, really, I won't go through all her projects and the list of you know, all the fancy museums and galleries where she exhibited and who bought her work. You can find it on her website or in different kind of catalogs and all her positions, you know, and recognition, which are multiple in number. What I want to do is to talk very briefly about some of her works and specifically female extension of 1997 and net art generator of 1997 and also in relation to time and the problems of today. Um, maybe you'd be talking about this yourself, Cornelia, in your lecture, so I'll be very brief and not give very much away. Um, for female extension, Cornelia generated hundreds of submissions from women artists to the net art competition announced by Kunsthalle Hamburg in 1997. And as these were accepted, then she had to generate 300 art projects and she developed um, the net art generator, an automated system for generation of art. These projects were the subject of the recent discussion at ZKM uh, around two weeks ago, as she worked with um, Winnie Soon, who is an associate professor at Aarhus and also programmer to restore an art generator 
which is an old piece of software stopped working when Google updated its terms of use. With Winnie, Cornelia published the book Fix My Code. I don't, I can't show it to you, I don't have it, but it's also open access and you can also um, uh, access it online. It's a fascinating publication in so many ways as a format in terms of what it pays attention to and the gender politics of programming and the question of preservation of digital art and the continuation of the politics of the work. What I want to highlight here is how the questions of automated production of art, you know, against the idea of the author, the collaboration with software and recognition of the agency of software in the process of making art and culture, but also the questions of copyright, commons, value of art and ownership formed around those art pieces did not only keep developing in her work, in Cornelia's work since the 90s, but also remain among some of the biggest problems of our societies today. You know, what is valued? How is value distributed? How to survive in technical infrastructures? So another example in the same vein in your recent, um, is your recent leadership in, um, on the research project on the aesthetics of, of the commons with the Zurich University of the Art, which was also a multi-level, a multi-format um, project, but also resulted in the publication Aesthetics of the Commons, and as many other and all project, all books by Cornelia, I think it's also open access and you can find it online. And to slowly bring these threads together, I would like to return to the NetArt generator. And as you mentioned, Cornelia, in your ZKM talk, at the conceptual level, the NetArt generator engaged with software infrastructures, search engine politics, dysfunctionality of the API, and something that started as a feminist intervention by automated art production, raising the question of the authorship of software, in fact, keeps its inquiry into software cultures alive and renewed at every time at which in which it operates. So at this moment, as we're trying to, to reuse it, it now acts as a powerful re reflection tool on the monopoly of Google, uh, which brings me to the final words of this introduction. There were times when digital techno-feminist art that started certain forms of inquiry and intervention felt outdated and forgotten. Certainly to me, my own work in digital art uh, felt that way. But today I think that what we are seeing is the revival of um, this um, forms of inquiry, a certain revival of the work, the kind of spirit of net art and software art and digital art of the 90s. And the reason for that is that the questions that these movements formulated came now to the fore again with platformization, with algorithmic culture, with software prescribing social and cultural interactions. And I think this work aged incredibly well and better than almost any other work I can think of. Certainly recently I was reading for some reason, um, some kind of focus, uh, focused research and critical theory of the nineties on something that was called consumer culture. There was a big deal um, of um, excitement about consumer culture in the nineties. And somehow I, it ended on my, on my desk and I was thinking, well, that didn't age very well. Who would, now, <laughs> you know, who would now in the moment of climate catastrophe would be able to uphold, you know, th those kinds of questions that they were discussing, like, and that was all about affirmation of kind of individual developing their individuality through kind of this aestheticized consumption. And I thought, well, yeah, that is that, <laughs> you know, as a, as a form of question. And, um, all, and I think um, the, what deserves a separate re reflection is indeed how your work on gender technology, politics and capitalism is as alive as ever and how these things, you know, um, go so strong as, as a forms of questioning. So um, I'm finishing now. I'm very much looking forward to your talk and thank you very much for being here. Um, and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Olga. I'm overwhelmed, but I won't make any comments at this point. Um, we'll see, I'll show some of the things you've mentioned, but not everything. So let me share my screen. Uh, 
Okay, here we go. And uh, also, I have to thank you, Olga, and uh, particularly also Lily for organizing the event and the kind invitation. As Olga already has mentioned, we have known each other for a long time, and I'd say we are both children of the 90s net culture. And it's interesting to see how we have both moved on from, from there in different directions, of course, a little bit different directions, also using different tools for our work while at the same time our paths seem to regularly meet. And the last occasion you have mentioned it is this book, which um, I'm just an editor of, but uh, Olga made a really relevant uh, contribution and um, the aesthetics of the commons, a very uh, central concept uh, for the aesthetics of the commons for us has been the notion of organizational aesthetics. And that is, uh, that is uh, a notion that uh, that is reoccurring in my in my own thinking about uh, my own work, what it is about, and you have already addressed it a little bit. I'm very much um, basically. I think the many different things I've been doing in the last 20, 25 years. Uh, I'm very much interested in the digital and digital network technology and how it forces us to rethink aesthetics, to rethink what, uh, art, basically. And uh, with the means it gives it a hand to organize and to distribute also the work we are doing. I think we are in a completely new era already since the mid 90s, but it's now kind of becoming more uh, omnipresent. People get more aware of it. and. We had a discourse on creativity of machines like 20 years ago, which reappears today in relation to artificial intelligence, for example. So a lot of um, questions um, concerning basic ideas of aesthetics are intrinsically related to the digital and digital network technology. And that has been in the center. And also in the center, um, a critique of the institution of art, the traditional art world. So the fancy galleries you have mentioned, Orca, is not really my world. Uh, uh, I sometimes visit them and if they really ask me and if it makes somehow sense, I also uh, exhibit there or contribute something, but I prefer to stay away from the fancy galleries and build my own structures and infrastructures. And that is where the relation is also to the commons and the digital commons, where which is a lot about self-organization, own infrastructures, but also using digital network technology to make things available to share, uh, uh, to share things uh, and yeah, share also knowledge and not just things. I will not go into that at all. I just wanted to briefly mention that this was our last uh, collaboration. For the day, um, I have decided to focus um, on a specific strand of work. Um, it will be, I will speak about OBN, Old Boys Network, which was a project um, uh, that was going on for five years, started in 97 and ended in 2001. So it's a historical project. Um, I will explain what it was and what we were trying to do. Um, but of course, uh, it's only interesting to talk about this project now because I, um, I think and I'm quite sure it has also relevance for us today. And um, so I'm not only speaking about OBN and cyber feminism, but also about the concept of techno feminism and the kind of a renewal around this thinking or new or renewed interest also in, um, in these questions of gender and technology. So what is Old Boys Network? The first slide I, sh I show, um, the screenshot of a website, uh, the website of the Old Boys Network, uh, the URL was obn.org. It still exists. It has not been touched since 2001, but uh, as it's uh, written in plain HTML, it's very stable. Everything is still there. At the same time, of course, it's not an, uh, an, an up updated or up-to-date website. It's also more a historical document. 
the old boys network described itself as the first cyber feminist uh, as the first sorry international cyber feminist alliance and we were active for five years in total from 97 to 2001 the unifying element of the network was the term cyber feminism the organization uh, stated concern was and i quote this from this old website to create spaces in which cyber feminists can research, experiment, communicate, and act. This includes virtual spaces, such as cyber feminist servers and the old boys mailing list, as well as temporary meetings, such as workshops and international conferences. All these activities have the purpose of providing a contextualized presence to different artistic, theoretical and political approaches related to cyber feminism. Sometimes mysterious and sometimes obvious, OBN sets an agenda for communication, intervention and production. So end of quote. The idea to create or to found OBN was triggered by an invitation to participate in the hybrid workspace in Kassel in 1997, which was part of Documenta 10. Uh, and I'm sure you all know Documenta, the world largest uh, exhibition of contemporary art. And they had this format called hybrid workspace to which 10 groups were invited to work, discuss, present and publish as part of this exhibition. The, this required a new initiative that would complement tactical media activism with gender specific themes and thus counter countering the male-dominated digital underground and hacker culture by developing an experimental approach to intertwining gender political issues with aesthetic strategies. OBN had then been founded in Berlin in early summer 97. And so the idea was born to use the invitation to Kassel to hold the first Cyber Feminist International Conference. From the very beginning, our organizational, our organizational form was, a, of, was of great concern and it should remain flexible and at the same time adhere, adhere to certain principles. The slogan, the mode is the message, the code is the collective, was representative of our concern to include awareness of the conditions of production and presentation as an essential feature of the quality of a work, which is why it was also important to develop our own structures and organizational forms and formats. Codifying the rules as part of the FAQ on our website made this approach transparent and acted as an invitation to join, to question and help shape and restructure the OBOS network. For the first conference in Kassel, OBN decided to publish an open call and to the extent possible, invite participation from anyone who expressed interest in proposing a personal approach to cyber feminism. 36 positions were eventually presented under, under the theme targeting content. To capture the spirit of the moment, we collaborated to write and publish the 100 antithesis describing what cyberfeminism is not. Later, this manifesto would find its way into art history, for example, in the anthology of 20th century art, um, a kind of a huge encyclopedia on um, one century of art in Germany published by um, the Staatliche Museen, uh, State Museums in Berlin. In 2002, art historian Verena Kuni described the manifesto as a parody of the self-explanatory rhetoric common to manifestos. In principle, however, the manifesto signals the agreement of OBN, in this case of the conference participants, not to provide definitions of the term cyberfeminism, not to make universally valid statements and instead to give equal space to individual approaches. This just uh, as a quick example of the work. In the five years in which OBN was, act 
uh, active, three international conferences were organized in different personal constellations. After Kassel, the next type of feminist international followed in Rotterdam in collaboration with Next Five Minutes, the Festival for Tactical Media, and the very cyber feminist international in Hamburg in 2001. We published the conference proceedings with individual contributions in three printed readers. And in addition, there were numerous appearances at international festivals and conferences and contributions by OBN to exhibitions and publications. These readers um, have been printed, but they are also available as PDFs still on the OBN.org website. Contributions of OBN were realized, for example, at the International Performance Symposium in Frankfurt at the networking meeting, at the Festival for Electronic Arts in Maribor, the Next Five Minutes Festival for Tactical Media in Amsterdam, at the International Women's University IFU, the exhibition Mondo Imaginario in Zurich at Schethalle, the Symposium Dialogues and Debates, an international symposium on feminist positions in contemporary art in Bremen, in the condition, uh, exhibition Net Condition at ZKM, or the, um, the Symposium Informatica Feminale of a feminist information scientist in Bremen. So this list is certainly not complete, but it already gives an impression of the different fields and discourses to which OBN um, has been connected or has connected itself. It was, of course, the art context, uh, media art in particular and performance art, but also media activism, uh, feminist scholarship and feminist art criticism. And um, so here we have um, not a very good <laughs> photo of our event in ZKM, the Center for Art and uh, Media in Karlsruhe, 1999, where we were participating in the big uh, and very controversial exhibition Net Condition, which was uh, like the first really huge attempt of a museum to um, make a comprehensive uh, show of net art. And um, it has been uh, quite interesting what happened, uh, different um, things happened, protests by net artists and so on. Um, what we did there was uh, um, we did a little intervention, OBN at ZKM, where we wrote a manifesto. And because we had just uh, been in touch with ZKM people for the event, we had the book launch we had two weeks ago. One of the chief curators, um, she told me she still holds in her private archive, a leaflet that, were, that we were throwing from the balcony of the, for, at the opening, which was in light blue, OBN at ZKM manifesto. And we made a lot of claims what we were claiming that should happen at ZKM. And one thing which, was, which I found like 20 years later was incredibly funny is that we were asking for regular survival training. And as you know, Peter Weibel is like the big boss at ZKM and still is and <laughs> will be forever, for example. <laughs> in a, so, um, and they have been criticized a lot for this, you know, his kind of um, position, which seems untouchable. So this uh, claim of uh, regular survival training was very funny. And the curator told us she was very young assistant curator at the time. And she was incredibly afraid of us because we were so radical and so violent. <laughs> I did not remember any of this. So this was kind, kind of funny, um, um, funny coincidence. And of course, I immediately asked her to donate uh, her leaflet to the archive that we are going to build, of which I will also speak in a minute. And she refused to. She said, no, that's her Mona Lisa and she won't give it away. <laughs> So that was just this little anecdote to not to make it too dry and see that a lot of stuff was, was happening and going on with, you know, behind such one photo. So um, I want to frame it a little bit also in the context of the time of early cyber feminism, as you probably are aware of, we did not invent cyber feminism. It was not invented by Oppo's network, but rather by an Australian artist group called VNS Matrix. And uh, at the same time, also Sadie Plant, um, 
who you certainly also know, published this book, Zeros and Ones, and they have conceived of this term uh, at the same time, the early 90s. So the spirit of the time was that with the advent of cyberspace, a new territory had emerged that not only enabled real-time global communication, but was especially inspiring for its potential to house identities detached from their physical and social realities. And the most important characteristics of, of uh, cyber feminism, I would say, were that the decentralized and horizontal structure of the internet promised also uh, decentralization uh, of society, which would lead to flat hierarchies in all areas of society, which was back then equaled with a feminization of society. So that was one idea. The other that for many, the possibility of endlessly inventing new ideas and new, not ideas, new identities, and thus subverting binary heteronormative subjected, sub subjectivity. So uh, this whole idea of identity playing with identities um, was a very, very important thing in the 90s. And underlying to all this was, a, in my opinion, quite essentialist assumption, which was that the nature of the digital machine and digital network technologies is in, in, inextricably linked to the nature of women or the female or the feminine. And of course, this is uh, quite essentialist and shows already what kind, some of my criticism is uh, about that today. So obviously, so I just wanted to mention these two um, predecessors or these basically inventors of cyber feminism. And when I heard first time of the term cyber feminism, I was not really excited about it. As, uh, it was in the mid nineties when there was a lot of hype uh, cyber, around cyber something, cyber sex and cyber money and all this stuff going on. And it had, uh, nevertheless, it had a certain quality it was kind of sticking to my mind. And um, I think something worked about this term cyber feminism because it kind of was adopting the spirit of the time, which was this excitement about digital network technology. At the same time, it made a reference to feminism, which uh, was associated, which not was not very popular in the mid nineties, not like today. Feminism is a fashion statement today. That was not at all the case in the 90s. Um, so I saw the potential of the combination of this hip cyber thing with the kind of outdated feminism, ideas of feminism that were floating around in the mid 90s would actually bear some potential to, uh, yeah, to, to create uh, new spaces and new ideas. So, um, but of course, you know, I won't go into detail with kind of, uh, you know, what we did and what the different approaches were. Uh, All together, we had, uh, I think, 180 people contributing to the Old Boys Network alone. And for me, with with the work of Sadie Plan and BNS Matrix, I mean, which was were both incredibly popular at the time. So it was like this new uh, spirit also that we could overcome uh, the, this kind of notion of earlier feminisms, in particular eco-feminism, that uh, technology was male uh, uh, connotated and, and, uh, and it was basically the nature that women had to deal with because, you know, nature and women man technology. So it was about overcoming these um, these old ideas and trying to do something new, which had a really uh, kind of very encouraging and, and enthusiastic um, uh, spirit to it. At the same time, um, I thought that a lot of what was coming with early cyber feminism was problematic, and I wanted to really to open it up to uh, less essentialist uh, ways of thinking and um, and producing, and that was my motivation to start to work with Oboe's Network and uh, also with this gesture of saying, okay, the VNS Matrix uh, existed and they had their uh, they had their, their great achievements and also Sadie Plant, 
but we want to go a step further. And for that, we need a platform, we need a context. And because it can only be a collaborate, co co um, collaborative effort. So that was the, the motivation to build uh, the structure. Um, and I think it's, it's quite important to emphasize that uh, if you look at the OBOS network from now, to, to look at two different perspectives. One is the content, which you say, okay, everything related to cyber feminism. At the same time, we kind of refused to define what cyber feminism exactly was. Of course, it opened the field, it opened the field of associations, but at the same time, uh, we wanted to try to keep it really open um, within the field of gender and technology. So the content, and at the same time, uh, it was very important for us to 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 really uh, to really conceive new forms of organization, also to explore what um, the digital network technology, what would that, what new forms of organization would uh, would would be possible with this new technology, and that is something that still excites me to today because I think we need desperately to think of new forms of political organization, which uh, are adequate to our contemporary time. And so that was one experiment to, to kind of suggest a political context, uh, which did not prescribe any ideological ideas, uh, but kind of opened a context for discussion. Uh, and the purpose of this space, of course, was to have a discussion and to develop things together. And at the same time, keep an eye on the structure of this space and keep an awareness, keep it open, keep it also fluid. I mean, it changed um, all the time after the first conference, people left and other people joined. So it was permanent, uh, also a restructuring. We had a core group for, for some time and an associated network. Then we had several working groups for another time. So uh, it was not an, an it was not a fixed form, you know, for an organization at all. So we were playing on two levels with this kind of, you know, not being really clear what is cyber feminism, not being really clear what is old boys network, and of course this attracts a certain kind of people uh, who are you know, who understand this is an invitation to come in, to join in and to contribute something. But of course, it also invited a lot of, of criticism uh, because it, it also represented a certain understanding of politics and this kind of misunderstanding uh, of not clearly defining your political goals and not making very precise state political statements that um, kind of until today uh, triggers a lot of criticism. So um, anyway, I think the spirit of the time and, and what we have done uh, in these five years has become a little bit uh, clear. And I would uh, jump to, to, the, to the present time, you know, for me, Opus Network is clearly situated and cyber feminism as well in the past. And I suggested in many occasions to understand cyber feminism as a historical concept, uh, which needs to be understood and read in the concept, uh, context of its time. Um, and uh, at the same time, I was looking for a new term that would be more open again and more adequate for the present. And this is how I arrived at the term techno-feminism. And techno-feminism has been suggested by, um, by the sociologist Judy Weizmann. She's based in London and for her work, she combines feminist perspectives and methods with the field of science and technology studies with STS with the aim of not only analyzing techno politics, but also developing projects of social transformation. When Weizmann refers to techno feminism, she does not understand it as a theoretical project or political stance. Rather, techno feminism means an approach to understanding the relationship between gender and technology, referring to the idea of the mutual shaping of gender and technology in which technology is both a source and a consequence of gender relations. So this is a very uh, important um, statement. 
And this approach neither dismisses technology as oppressive to women, nor heralds technology as automatically liberatory, as was the case with cyber feminism. So what do technology and gender have to do with one another? And how are they mutually produced in ever new configurations? Can they even be thought of as two separate categories? And is it not necessary to bring a series of additional agents into play in order to provide a more complete picture? These are also the questions that um, I am asking at the beginning of my book, The Beautiful Warriors. I think I have a picture here. Yep. Uh, that Olga already mentioned. And these questions open up a field in which a myriad of feminist approaches to technology are being conceived and practiced. And um, if we have time, I can introduce a few of these positions later on. In fact, the research of Judy Weizmann has produced some basic insights into the field, which also after 20 years provide a valuable basis for techno-feminist analyses and practice. And I would like to quote a few. So all the, um, what you hear now are quotes by Judy Weizmann from the book Technofeminism. We rarely have a chance to live outside technology. Technological change is the intractable fate of the world and irreversible process. The internet is marked by its military origins and the white male hacker world has spawned it. The contemporary use of the net by transnational corporations, financial markets, global crimina criminal networks, military strategists and international racists is a means to evade social regulations, entrench political control and concentrate economic power. Men still heavily dominate these institutions and groups, and there are dramatic gender differentials in access to and control over electronic networks. Technology is a key source of man's power and a defining feature of masculinity. I mean, this one simple sentence, I think, gives enough material for a whole seminar. <laughs> Hierarchies of sexual difference profoundly affect the design, development, diffusion, and use of technologies. Feminists have identified men's monopoly of technology as an important source of their power. Women's lack of te technological skills are an important element in their dependence on men. While liberal feminism conceived of the problem as one of equality of access and opportunity, socialist and radical feminism analyzed the gendered nature of technology itself. As with science, the very language of technology, is sim its symbolism is masculine. Therefore, to enter this world, to learn its language, women have first to forsake their femini femininity. Is there an alternative to the limited options of simply rejecting existing technologies or uncritically embracing technological change? Can feminism steer a path between technophobia and technophilia? The relationship between technoscience and society is currently being subjected to profound and urgent questioning. The promise of technofeminism then is twofold. It offers a different way of understanding the nature of agency and change in the post-industrial world, as well as the means of making a difference. And to summarize these quotes, I think they really get to the heart of the problem. Um, and also things have evolved since then, since the writing and publication of the book in 2004. Um, I think a lot of the things that um, <clears throat> Judy Weizmann analyzed and found in her research um, are still a good uh, basis for discussion and work today. And so I understand technofeminism I, uh, as an interface between the world of feminism and the world of the technology sphere. And of course, when I say feminism with feminism, 
uh, come the whole set of, of values, of methods, of way of thinking and working, which I'm also not going to um, explain in more detail. But if you have time to look at some specific projects, we see uh, that there have been a lot of uh, new spaces conceived in the last years of queer feminist hack labs, for example, where feminist values of how you deal um, with knowledge, with hierarchies that uh, are being produced to uh, to different knowledges and um, uh, th how they deal differently with that and um, how these spaces are being used for unlearning certain um, uh, certain uh, things that we that we all have been brought up with and um, how we can educate and re-educate in different ways and how it's also obvious how important it is to think of independent spaces and um, maybe that is also something that is interesting in the context of the university um, you know what is what is possible within a university setting and what is not possible within a university setting for what do we really need independent spaces for what kind of thinking and working and so on so um techno feminism and its focus on gender also needed to expand to acknowledge the fact that there are many different forms of inequality often operate together and in separate each other like race, uh, class, gender, ethnicity, ability, and others. Um, also, the concept of gender has been expanded by the notion of queerness, naming an orientation towards shifting social norms and blur categorical boundaries to create unexpected relationships. So um, that's just these last few sentences to indicate also before I was talking about what has remained the same, but also what has changed. I think we are in a completely different understanding at the moment when we talk about identities, about queerness, um, things like that. And of course, the whole world of digital network technology is completely different uh, from 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So it needs a, a constant kind of re-adaption, a reformulation of what the relation of gender technology are how they are you know how they influence each other because they both change constantly so um yeah i i think i just uh, end with that part and would uh, like to go back uh, for a moment to to this idea uh here i have some examples, maybe we have time and go back to that later. The question of the archive, uh, which we have been addressed already. Uh, so we are working at the moment on an archive of the OPOIS network and why an archive and why now? Um, the simple answer is because of great current interest in the topics around gender and, and technology and uh, after we had stopped working in 2001 with the Oboes Network, we, I mean, we, I just left everything there. I collected the material. I still have everything in boxes uh, stored under my bed and in my storage. And so all the material was just sitting there. And for many years, no, there was really no, no or not much interest in this gender and technology thing. It seemed it has been a hype and it has gone away. And all of a sudden, a few years ago, maybe say five, four or five years ago, uh, there was new uh, initiatives coming up. There were ideas around xenofeminism and all kinds of new feminisms with new prefixes that in some way or another kind of referred back to cyberfeminism, cyberfeminist ideas. And so I started to get invitations to panel discussions and I was like, uh, presented as this woman from history who back in the 90s did something interesting and I was asked to talk about it and and there were some events where I felt incredibly uncomfortable because it, I, I went to these events in a kind of a naive way I said okay yeah people want to know they want to ask me how it was so I tell them and I realized that I'm in a completely different setting 
also there was some feminist events or so-called feminist events, which I thought this has nothing to do with feminism, what's going on there. And so I tried to kind of confront myself with this. And I, I also got a bit depressed for some time because I thought, oh my God, now this gender, gen, uh, not gender, this generation gap is happening and I don't understand anymore what the young people are doing and what they're thinking about. And luckily, um, I, I, I had a few months later a very wonderful collaboration with a very young curator from Canada and she she uh, she proved she was the uh, proof that it was not a generational problem. She also assured me that it was not a generational problem. But obviously, what what was spreading at the time, in especially in the art world, was kind of a sort of a new hipness and a new uh, a new also approach to feminism, which uh, totally I felt totally alien to. And but I luckily I also met younger women who felt the same. So I, I knew it was not a generational thing. It was basically really, a, if you if you will, an ideological thing, you know, you can, you know, they just have different values and uh, different ideas and different mindsets. But I also felt the need at one point, it's no longer enough to tell what has been the past, but, but also to provide a more comprehensive resources about the past and also uh, kind of analyze what is the difference or what was the different conditions of the time when we were working with the conditions of where we are now and why we cannot simply adopt cyber feminism as if it would be something of today. But uh, that's why I was also suggesting a new term and to work with techno feminism. So that was quite a process that was going on for years. And I was very frustrated because really strange things happened. And I felt completely misunderstood by a lot of people, which were, were writing all texts about Oboe's network, also critical texts. And I thought, oh my God, this is a total misunderstanding, you know? And uh, how can we deal with this? And so I started to address this question. So we need, um, we need to, to go back, we need to, um, yeah, we need to revisit uh, this time and see what materials we have and we have to uh, make them available. And so this idea of the archiving project was born. And also um, I met uh, a friend, my friend Julian Pierce from VNS Metrics, the Australian artist group in Switzerland two years ago. And she told me that they just got uh, nice funding from the government to build an archive of their work which of course is also an historical work because the group doesn't exist anymore, but it shows the relevance of the work for today. And so this slowly this idea came together in my head, said, okay, we need, we, we need an archive of the Old Boys Network. And so I was addressing this and when I was invited to talks, I was, you know, talking to people about this problem and it, it, it really worked to my big surprise. I was invited to a talk in Kassel at the university, Documenta City and the Department of Documenta Studies. And I was uh, talking about this problem and uh, the, the Documenta Studies professor Nora, Nora Sternfeld, she was completely excited about this idea and she uh, put an application together and she organized some funding for us so we can now work on this archive. And uh, this is something that is going on at the moment. And of course, uh, this archives is, is, is about, we need the past in order to learn something out about the present. This is a very strong feeling I have. And so it's a huge challenge. And of course, it's a weird thing for an artist to, to deal so much with the past and not constantly make new works, which is actually, you know, the, the, the economy of the art world is to produce new stuff all the time and not so much deal with the old things. But I've been confronted with this question many times because I did a lot of digital work, which constantly becomes obsolete and needs new uh, energy and thinking and time and resources. So, but I, I try to do both. I try to really take care of, uh, of the past and of the documents that we have. And, 
rethink and uh, kind of apply or try to see how they apply or try to see how they influenced uh, also who I am now and what I'm doing now and what I'm interested in now. So uh, we are working on this archive and I don't know, this is probably not so interested. It's just some photos that I showed to the Documenta archive recently. You know, tons of photos and tons of CDs and, and tapes and ephemera and folders and stuff. And it's, it was actually much more than I ever thought um, we have. And so we have to really think of, um, yeah, how, how we want to process the material it has, of course, I also have to admit I never did an archive before or any archival work. I, I was approaching this very naively. And now I, I have to learn the lesson. You know, I'm working now with with archival uh, professionals, and and of course we 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 do not only want to bring this material to the Documenta archive, which is the plan now, but we are thinking of creating our own a digital archive format, which we can uh, operate also independently and possibly copy and host in different servers. So the old rule of uh, we don't die, we multiply is very present in our negotiations, which is again, of course, a big challenge for Documenta Archive because they work in a completely different way. So, that's where we are at the moment. And for those of you who are more interested in, you know, getting a bit deeper uh, into this, we have a discussion event tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. in Berlin time, where we have invited four experts to contribute to our thinking process at the moment. And yeah, that is one thing. So it's 7.25 and we have different options at the moment. Um, I could uh, simply go back and uh, show a few works or a few uh, contemporary techno-feminist practices, um, or we can start the discussion right away, whatever you prefer, I leave it to you. Or I have a third option, actually, which is probably the best. So I will just quickly take you to, uh, I'm so sorry, we have to run through this. I will quickly not go too deeply, but for five minutes, um, I will uh, talk about purple noise, which is, I mean, you have already realized now I'm I'm an artist, but I saw also, I'm also a researcher. I'm, I'm not only doing my own art practice, but I'm also interested in what other people do. I'm interested in theories. I'm um, trying to, uh, to build context uh, as we did with the aesthetics of the commons, the creating commons context. So, but this is an example of, um, of my own practice, which is again a collective practice. Uh, it's a group called Purple Noise. Uh, it's still going on. It's an interdisciplinary techno-feminist research uh, and artist group that uses uh, real events, like physical uh, events in physical space to examine social media as a venue for large scale political manipulation. So that was our starting point after having been socialized in the 90s uh, with digital technology, of course, social media were a no-go for me for a very long time. And of course, for good reason, uh, until I realized uh, the power of social media, until I realized how much power they actually have on over people's life and not only people's lives, but also over uh, political, large-scale political decision-making processes. And the moment I realized this power, I thought we cannot, it's not enough just to not go on Facebook or to ignore it, but we have to deal with that. And that was the moment where, uh, uh, where we started uh, Purple Noise. And it was also a text in the book, uh, The Beautiful Warriors by Christina Gramatikopoulou, a, a Greek, uh, theoretician, she was exploring the relationship between 
a protest in the streets in Spain where she was living at the time. There was this huge protests and how they were uh, shown uh, on social media and how they were represented on social media and what the effect was between these protests on social media uh, onto the street again. So this dynamic, the circular dynamic. Um, she wrote a text about that and um, I found this incredibly inspiring. And so we started this group. Christina is also part of this group and um, we're kind of a group between eight and 10 usually, sometimes more. It depends. And uh, we started to look into it and we explored and we saw that this kind of manipulation, for example, during Brexit, um, during the US elections four years ago, and as we know through the Cambridge Analytica scandal, there has been a whole range of interference in democratic elections and polls. So the area we are moving into is social media, which is remarkable because net activists usually try to avoid and stay away from these commercial platforms for obvious reasons. And basically, I think most of my friends are not on social media. My, I think all my best friends are not on social media and closest collaborators. <laughs> so, but we realized how powerful these platforms have become with half of the world's population using them regularly, often with no other access to the internet. We understood that it's necessary to get involved and get our hands dirty and to understand the dynamics. And this is a very difficult, um, Undertaking it's also unpleasant because the workings of social media platforms is totally black box. Um, you will never find out what is actually what what the regulatory mechanisms or the algorithms behind are. So you just have to test and try and test and try and test and try. And once you find out something how it works, it might happen very well that it's different the next day or the next week or the next month. So it's very frustrating. And, um, but at the same time, we try really to do something that is also fun. And what we do or how we try to, to practice this, uh, our critique is uh, behind this assumption or, or what, what would we try is, yeah, we try to make interventions and we have developed a very strong uh, graphical presence, which is very visible also in, in this masses of information that is being processed. Um, and our uh, interventions always have an online component, uh, but also a component in physical space, uh, such as a public space or, or of the street or others. And for exploring the dynamics in social media, we have identified a number of features that are essential, of course, hashtags. So for all, for, for all the new uh, interventions, we create new hashtags. We try to work with meme um, and uh, memes. And we have, of course, that this is all something which is not so easily controllable. You know, you can try to reverse engineer, but uh, there's a lot of uh, things going on in this dynamics, which is out of control. Uh, but also, um, yeah, uh, this coherent visual language is quite important. So you can hear, see, this is some of our posters that how we, that is actually a picture of our first uh, intervention we did um, at the uh, women, City of Women's Festival where there was a demo organized, uh, official demo that uh, was, uh, attended by thousands of people and we kind of hijacked this demonstration. So we did not organize a demo. The demo was organized. We just distributed our placards and we had a photographer and a filmmaker who was uh, following us around and who made photos of this demo. I don't know, do we have another one? Um, which we then put on our Instagram and our other platforms. Um, and and basically the purpose was to 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 give the impression that uh, that it that that it was our demonstration and that we had that it was all about purple noise basically and so it worked quite well because people were willing to carry our <laughs> our banners <laughs> and um, so that was the first experiment. 
and a part of our visual language are the signs. It was one point where we realized the when we started the research that there were uh, there were 36 official gender symbols, and we decided that 36. If it's 36, it can be basically any number of gender symbols. Why limit it to 36? So we came up with this, uh, uh, with its variable uh, gender symbols, and we also invite people to create their own gender symbols and explain them. That was one intervention in the street where people were drawing their gender symbols and explaining what they meant. Um, we wrote also several manifestos, um, different ones from the one in 97, <laughs> um, which basically refer to the situation of people using social media and, um, yeah, I won't read it out. The second uh, intervention was at, the, at Transmediale, where we did more focus on uh, Transmediale, the media festival. Uh, where we made this, this, this statement, opting out is not an option. So basically saying, if you just don't use social media, it's not an option. So we have to find other ways of undermining them and working with them, understanding their dynamics. So one of the uh, memes that we were experimenting where it was inspired by Donna Haraway's uh, Camille stories, The Feelers. So we made a feeler workshop where people could basically create their own feelers and uh, explained what uh, what they could kind of what these feelers were able to do and what they think they need uh, basically new uh, senses uh, for the current time. So it was very playful, but also storytelling. It was a bit of tinkering. And uh, at the opening of Transmediale, we were handing out or we're giving away these feelers to people and have doing uh, interviews with them. And it was quite funny. I mean, some people can really jump into this and start telling stories and uh, relate uh, basically the things they are thinking about and dealing with related to technology to such a situation. The last uh, uh, intervention we did was on May Day um, last year, it was the Manifesto Techno-Feminist Care, where, where we referred to the notion of care uh, and technology in, in the context of Corona. So we also created this new gender symbol, which a bit looked like the coronavirus, you can see here. Another, um, another manifesto. Um, which is all on uh, on the website of Purple Noise, purplenoise.org, if you want to have a look, or in the social media on different platforms. And for the May Day, we ask ourselves the question, as I said before, there is this kind of interplay or this relation between offline and online protests. It was obvious there could not be much protest going on uh, in the street. So we were thinking of a way of protesting online. And so we created this mask with our symbol and we used um, artificial intelligence who cre that created thousands of faces for us. And we just put our mask on all these diverse faces and put this, um, put this uh, faces with our masks on our social media as a form of, of protest. So I think I don't go deeper into that. That was just an example of, so this is going on it's more, at the moment, it's a bit more quiet because we really want to, we are planning to have a physical meeting for a long time, which cannot happen, uh, but we are optimistic that we can start working again in September. So this was one example of, uh, my, of my contemporary work amongst many other things. So I think I should stop here for now and uh, we can have a discussion. Now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Cornelia. Um, of course, I have so many questions, but also um, I want to give uh, a chance to people to ask you questions. So while everyone's thinking about their questions, um, I'll just 
kind of talk to you very briefly. It's not really a question, it's something um, as like a comment. Um, and then people could, if they could unmute themselves and pose questions themselves, uh, that would be good. Um, and I was listening to it was so nice to be, I felt normal. <laughs> I was, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <a> thank you. <laughs> when you said people socialized in the 90s to that, I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> and um, and of course, the sense of you know the, the the spirit of the of the 90s, some of the spirit of the old boys, boys network that was uh, and I, re I remembered it so clearly was about you get an invitation instead of making a personal career out of it you mm. open it up to people you make an open invitation you remove all names you become anonymous you create spaces for others and that was um what was you know um honorable to do at the time or that what what was the the struggle was um about uh, and then, of course, um, you know, with post-internet, it was immediately thrown out of the window. Everyone was so glad to jump back on the in personal career and making mm -hmm. a name. And the, the the speed and the force with which this kind of accumulation um, uh, returned was quite um, chilling. And um, but it, what's interesting, um, I guess, what I wanted to kind of um, Think about a little bit is that throughout your work even in the purple noise you could say it is this question of creating a space um, for others and creating a space uh, uh, organization or space or infrastructure or some kind of um, opening that um, it remains an open question uh, I think for you as well and and it's um, uh, but what is interesting for me that I've heard in your talk is it's not only a question of big capitalism, uh, but also, for instance, how we come back to certain um, structures such as the nation state, uh, you know, in uh, because you would imagine that net art and um, uh, fem uh, kind of cyber feminist um, um, artists were active in different countries and, and that countries don't have infrastructure or museums even recognizing this uh, this mm -hmm. work all of this work just disappears there's no chance of ever having an archive and this kind of um so on the one hand this into so this from the kind of total refusal of institutions in the 90s to mm -hmm. all or maybe uh, appropriation and and um reuse to like questions of how do you structure spaces in um, how you open spaces in in um, kind of dominant uh, super scale super scale social media that you can't possibly take on and destroy but you still have to intervene in how do you structure mm -hmm. spaces when you have to collaborate with um, state funded museums or um, when, when forms of memory that are more survivable depend on this older institution, such as university or museum, mm. how so there are so many forces that are at play here. And it's not only just um, like having one identity, like, uh, you know, Boys Network is accused of not having, but all these other dimensions as well. And yeah, it's not really a question. I'm, I was just thinking about all this kind of, um, sides to the notion of organization structure space that um, uh, are so uh, important today uh, as well as mm. you know uh, at the time yeah I think yeah I think yeah, I know what your question is <laughs> it's not very clearly formulated but I have some ideas uh, I think it's very it's very tricky because you're always somehow involved with institutions and with larger structures as you know wherever and I think what I found really very useful um, is this very basic idea of feminist of feminist thinking is to when you enter a room or a space or whatever you try to understand what the power relations in this space are, where your position is. Because it's not only uh, that other people have power over you, you also have power over other people, you know, to locate yourself, your position. This is a very basic thing. And sometimes when I do lectures, 
uh, I start my lecture with this exactly that. I call it feminist check-in to say, okay, where are we? Where are we? Who, who is here? Why are we here? Where, where are we? I mean, what is the context? You know, who is working? Who is getting paid for work? Who is ex being exploited for work? <laughs> you know, all these kind of parameters. And I think there is not a clear rule of how you do it, but, um, and I'm not saying that it makes your life easier if you have this routine of being aware of power structures. I think it makes life very miserable very often, you know. But that's for me the starting point. And it will there will never be an ideal situation, you know. You're always corrupted somehow. Uh, even within your own structure, I mean, this is a total utopia that if you have, a, if you organize your own group or your own infrastructure or your own organization, that this is then, then everyone is equal and there is no power struggle. So power structures going on, you know, that that is also something we learn from, from feminism, you know, feminist, uh, feminists like the text, um, the the tyranny of structurelessness told us exactly that, you know. It's, it's not possible. It's oh, there's always something going on. But uh, I think when uh, you know, of course, you can be more aware and you can have more influence if it's your own structures. You cannot easily change a university power structure in which you're either a student or a lecturer or a professor or uh, whatever. Um, there's a very strict uh, hierarchy, but it's always a question how. First of all, an awareness that you understand where you are in the structure and how you want to deal with it. And my motto is until today that I'm not uh, rejecting institutions at all. I mean, totally, you know, I've been fully employed by university for some time, which was not the best time in my life, but <laughs> I survived it. <laughs> I've also worked with big institutions, with museums, which was also not the best experience in my life as an artist. But, you know, so it's like trying and testing. And it's always, um, I think it's very much about resources also. You always have to negotiate for resources. Uh, if I do something in for, with a big museum, it's very unlikely that the curators will spend a lot of time discussing with you and you you don't you know it's like it's a big machine you're just a part of a machine but you get something in return which you would not get elsewhere so you always have to negotiate it was the same thing when we went to documenta to documenta 97 because it is the world largest uh, most prestigious prestigious um, exhibition for for art but the hybrid workspace had, had hardly any money we, we we totally worked for free for in the hybrid workspace, you know. So of course the first thing, why why would I work for free for Documenta? And we were discussing it, and then we said, okay, we know what we're doing. We do it because it is an important platform, and the whole world looks at Documenta. So if we have something to say, if we have a message to distribute, we use this platform. You know, it's our strategy to do it. And there is another time where we would say, no, I don't work for free for a big institution. Either you pay me or I don't do it. So it's this permanent negotiation and the motto, which really is or a kind of an image, which is very useful for me is to situate myself uh, inside and outside big institutions. And that is again, you know, we just did that, the, this week we had this negotiation with Documenta Archive, which is a very powerful institution, official institution. And I like the idea that we work with them and we like it. I like the idea we challenge them. I also like the resources they have, you know. So we have to see if we find a mode that makes sense and that is possible for both of us. So they, they, they get something. Uh, they can live with or they appreciate and I can get the situation that I can live with. Uh, but of course, if they try to force us to do things like, for example, lock away all our material uh, under strict copyright or whatever, then there will be no solution. Then we just have to go away and do it without them. And of course, we have projects like monoscope and things, you know, that are very successful without 
you know, with ignoring copyright and with building their own infrastructures, but it's self self exploitation at the same time. So I think it's a permanent no negotiation between where do I get my resources from, uh, what compromises can I make? Sometimes you can also, we were discussing with a, with a documenta archive project that we also try to make our archive work uh, to a certain degree, a performative, uh, give it a performative element in the sense that we also try to show what happens when we confront documenta archive with our uh, with our requirements of op open access and, and, and kind of sustainable digital technology and things like that. And even if it doesn't happen in the end, we can, we can still have a process that makes vis things visible and maybe the next one who tries it in a few years is, you know, it's a different place. So, yeah. So thank you, Cornelia. Um, the uh, people who would like to ask a question under reactions, uh, there is a button called raise hand if you'd like to raise hand and ask a question. Um, then I could. Lily had so many questions. Come on. Uh, we also <laughs> have uh, someone in the chat actually, so I do have okay. questions, but I wondered whether uh, Karen would want to join us. Uh, I think, yes, there we go. My, my room is suffused in uh, light. Uh, so I'm just gonna put my light, excuse me, I'll just <laughs> put my actual light on to maybe just get rid of the, what looks like a phase. It doesn't, I actually am not on fire. <laughs> it's not. Smoke, <laughs> smoke. <laughs> oh, no, that still looks terrible. I can't help it. There's just too much sun coming through. I put a, a, a question actually, uh, Cornelia, in the in the chat, which is oh okay. It, it, I, I will just articulate it. You mentioned in your uh, discussion about um, your kind of pleasure at seeing that there wasn't a, an intergenerational uh, divide in in your thinking and the, the thinking of, of uh, younger feminists. And I I just wonder whether or not you think that. The, the, the feminist digital space is that space, is that space for us to come together. I mean, us, I mean, I'm sort of thinking me as a, as it were, as a, a, an older woman coming together with younger women in, in common purpose to actually mm. see the digital space as a place where we can unite in activism around things like you know, hashtag me too, or in in the UK, the new website that's just been developed. Everyone's invited. You know, whether or not this is the promise, you know, that we had imagined. This is something that is actually real, where we can translate our kind of activism online and actually see results offline. Mm. No, that is definitely true. But I think what uh, my irritation happened in the art world and. Uh, mainly, what you have mentioned now is activist contexts, which uh, are a bit uh, different in their dynamics. And Olga mentioned before post-internet art, which is something I did not, uh, I did not mention. But that uh, that is a very important term in this respect because that that is that was really a shift, you know, in the approach to of artists to the internet. And I think, uh, meanwhile, it's not so much, uh, it, 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 in a sense, you can say there was net art in the 90s and after that was post-internet art that may be, uh, may be called, you know, different generations. Uh, but I like the idea that generation does not have so much to do with age necessarily. Um, but um, so I think what you're saying is totally right, but the problem is really the dynamics of the art world, you know, it's, um, and as soon as, and that, that was something that we also experienced with the Old Boys Network, because we were very interdisciplinary. I was an artist, and I always understood the work that I'm doing for the network, for the building, as a kind of an, an, an aesthetic, uh, you know, a work on an aesthetic work, in a way, as my you know, a way of giving form to something. Um, in that case, uh, like a social space, a social organization. And the problem is, 
who is recognized for a work in, in, in the art context much more than the activist. And the activist also, but not, it's a totally different story in the art world. Is it uh, considered to be an artwork, you know? Is it my artwork? You know, is it like Cornelia Solfrank's artwork? Is the Oboe's network? Or what, how can we deal with this economy? Because I always wanted to be an artist and I wanted to be part of the art world uh, while knowing that this economy is very toxic and it can ruin everything, you know? So that's also part of the challenge to find ways and of course, you make experience. I think every group falls into the same traps. You know, there is one person who is better in publicity in speaking and is recognized as the speaker of the group, and suddenly is the leader and the director and the something. You know, and other others, they are better in doing other things in the background, and they they don't feel respected and acknowledged, and all this kind of dynamics. And so, I basically think yes, what you're saying. Uh, it is very much depends on not just gathering, but what is the purpose, you know, why are we gathering? And I think it's a different purpose if we say there's a there's a political problem, we want to want to stand up, we want to express, you know, like you you mentioned me too. Uh I think there was a spectacular uh spectacular uh thing going on with me too. It was unbelievable that it could happen and i know some of the older you know feminists in germany like really famous uh, in their 70s really famous socialist feminists they until today they reject me too because he said it's all about victimization of women and they want you know so there's different opinions on that i think it had an enormous power it was for a certain purpose and um in the art world, it's more difficult because, you know, Olga also mentioned that, you know, these individual careers uh, became possible, I would say, with post-internet art. In the 90s, people, some people tried to make individual careers, but they were not very successful with it. Because if you do a, if, you, if your artwork is a website, you know, I mean, no collector found, uh, you know, the, now we have M NFTs. Of course, we can now also sell our websites. Why not? So this is another <laughs> shift we are making. <laughs> but I don't know if it answered your question, but I think this coming together in an ideally, of course, over generations, also in OBN in the beginning, you know, that, that, that was really... Uh, ve very young women who came back to feminism because they because of the cyber uh, and feminists, you know, from 70s activists. So there was different generations. But the question is, what do you want? Why do you want to? Why do you want to come together with people? Do you, you know what do you want to achieve? And that makes the difference. Do you want to make a personal career, or do you want to really change? The world you want to be you want to get a, a a piece of the cake or do you want to you know no, or do you not like cake at all <laughs> i i love i love cake but yeah thanks for that that was a really <laughs> helpful response thank you good um so i don't know if we have another question but maybe i can um ask a question which I guess is sort of related to what you were just saying um, about intentions and changing the world but um, specifically I'm wondering about how uh, and you mentioned this in your talk how sort of like um, you know the perception of what the internet can do and digital technologies in general have changed so we're in a different moment now but is there mm -hmm. something about those technologies that you think um, is still particularly promising uh, or is it sort of, you know, or is the internet now the means to just kind of like organize uh, in real space? Um, because it's kind of, um, I don't know, I think, you know, I for example, I wonder, you know, if you are, um, what your views are on kind of like xenofeminism and that sort of uh, theoretical. Um, mm. I won't, uh, I won't, explain that here it's it's part of the book there is one text in the book in my book i published 
where someone else wrote about xenofeminism much more elaborate than I could have done it. Uh, basically, I'm not convinced. Um, um, Sorry, I lost your question. What was the first remark? I got irritated oh, by the yeah, but, I mean. <laughs> Is there something, you know, about digital technologies that you still... Ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. God, this bad question. Yeah, that's the worst. Because it leads us into total depression. Um, total hopelessness. <laughs> I think if you, if you really... I mean, the good thing is that, that we are not aware of uh, most of the stuff that's going on with us. So... Uh, and I think people, uh, Corey Doctorov recently said that, you know, talking about conspiracy theories, that of course, you know, the people have all reason <laughs> to have conspiracy theories because really bad things are going on. And most of this we, we even don't know. And I have to say, I'm also not interested. I cannot process this. So I have this vague idea that we are in a very, very bad situation, not just with digital media, you know, with the big five, with surveillance, with a lot of stuff going on and um, which is totally out of control of governments. I found myself recently in several interviews where I was saying, oh, we need more government control and things like that. And it's like, wait a second, what am I saying, you know? <laughs> <laughs> this is totally weird. Uh, but, you know, this is an expression of helplessness because we are so much in, uh, under, you know, controlled by these big corporations that they just dictate anything they like and they make any profit they like and they pay no fucking taxes at all. And, you know, they control the world. And, you know, the, to understand that there is just the, the choice between big five American corporations or three Chinese ones or two Russian ones. I mean, this is like the choice that we have at the moment. It's really not very good. But at least sometimes it, when I realize this, I think, okay, Germany is still quite good because we have crazy people, activist people here in Germany uh, who sue the government all the time. You know, they don't do anything but suing the government, collecting money, hiring lawyers, for all kinds of things related to digital rights and to digital technology and to things like that. And so I'm not saying that this changes uh, the world, but there's, there's a lot of people who are very aware and do really work I totally respect, you know, it's so, it's hard work to do. And um, I don't know, I try to, I, I like to believe that we can make a difference even by starting to make small differences because I know that I mean there was this uh, this big fire recently by this um, of the in France in Strasbourg of this internet hosting company where hundreds or thousands of servers burned and people lost their websites because actually they were not really there, were not, there was not enough backups on different places. So that was for me a very, uh, it was a really crucial moment because it showed you that a fire, something as basic and simple as a fire can destroy, you know, not just your website, but, uh, you know, that, that that is the cloud, the cloud burned, you know. And um, so talking to activists, you know, they said, okay, we now have, you know, we know what we what we have to do. We have to burn the cloud. <laughs> we have to find out where these centers are and they are all centered, you know. So, I mean, this is weird fantasies, but it's, uh, I think this relationship between also the, the, the this re physical realities also, detect, you know, re uh, attached to it and, and physical resources and and labor. So this whole notion of immateriality totally went away, which was very uh, uh, important in the 90s. We talked a lot about immateriality, which we learned better now that it's very material and exploiting the, the, the soil and the ground and the world and the people to produce this technology. I mean, alone this, you know, but 
and, and the trash that's being produced. So there's a lot of big problems, not only data and information sharing and security, but it's also a lot of like, in, environmental problems and other problems. So we are in a quite bad situation. I think we can state. And uh, with my students I had last winter, we were we looked at this uh, film, The Great, I think it's called The Great Hack about Cambridge Analytical scandal. And uh, and they and they said, oh, this is so depressing, you know, and we, we don't want it, or we then there must be something, you know, a way out. But I kind of insist that we have to confront this sort of depression, and it's essential that we understand this. And it doesn't mean that I throw my computer out of the window or that I delete my Facebook site, you know. I, I'm, but I know where I am, and it's. Um, I think. This, uh, this schizophrenia that technology puts us in at the moment, because we have this understanding of how bad things are, and there is not a way we can easily escape it or do things differently. We have to just, you know, we have to stand it somehow. We have to, that this is a very, I think, a very difficult situation. Uh, it's related, I uh, related to the, big environmental climate change issues because we know how bad everything is and we know we should immediately stop everything you know have a completely different life but it's not possible so we have to live that through you know this kind of tension that we know things are really bad and so how can we try to make things different and there is some people who try things and I still believe in, I mean, one belief is that we cannot go back. You know? It will not, the solution will not be without technology. That is for sure. So I think it uh, makes sense to think about positive uh, uh, developments for the future. Thank you. Um... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I completely share that. I um I'm just gonna say this. I was watching a video recently of I can't remember the name of the scholar, uh, but it was an American scholar, and they were talking about how in China, um, basically facial recognition happens all the time, and that they can kind of like um interpret people's emotions from changes in the skin that are not visible normally but uh you know are visible mm -hmm. with a camera and that on the basis of that the government can uh decide whether somebody is uh disagreeing with a political speech for example and send them to the camp and i was thinking who is this woman who's uh, spreading these conspiracy theories and then i looked into it and i was like oh my god this is actually this is actually um you know a real thing that's mm. happening um yeah so i think um I don't, yeah, maybe if uh, there are no, um, I just want to see if there's other people who want to kind of like, you know, add questions, but I wondered about, um, I guess in relation to this sort of what the, the significance of like local action is and how, you know, um, how people sort of organize and how, you know, do you mm. actually, are you able to engage with people outside of a circle that is already mm. um, familiar with, you know, your work and that is already kind of like part of this discourse, like how easy is it to actually get random people uh, to engage? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a good question because something I did not mention um, is, um, that is of course the question, you know, where do you start action? And this is again, takes me to really totally back to the to very basic feminist ideas where they started action and action that was incredibly powerful. So probably you um, are familiar with the concept of consciousness raising. That was this group, consciousness raising groups in, in the late 60s, early 70s, where it was self-organized groups where people met, um, women met to basically speak about a lot of body issues, you know, uh, issues related to birth control and specific, you know, female health issues, um, explored, uh, investigated their own bodies and things like that. And from there, um, <clears throat> it was, um, you know, consciousness rating, it was about sharing experiences, sharing everyday experiences. 
and by sharing everyday experiences, there was a realization that most problems are not personal problems, but that people tend to have similar problems, you know, that they are structural problems. And this realization that these structural problems, you know, then in combination with certain political theories enabled them to develop political claims and campaigns. All the big feminist campaigns developed out of this consciousness raising groups. It's really impressive. It's a, it's a very, it's a defined method. Someone wrote a, a kind of not big text, a few pages text about it. And it's a really, um, I thought about this text a lot uh, in terms of how, how can I apply this? And I made several attempts, experiments to apply this method of, as described by feminists uh, of consciousness raising to technology. And I, I was running several workshops and I thought, okay, now people know that I'm crazy, you know, or they will tell me that I'm crazy to do that. You cannot do that. You cannot, you know, replace your body experience with technology. And, but I was so interested what happens. And so I did, I had the opportunity to run three different workshops and I wrote a text about it not so long ago where I was trying to evaluate it. And I think it's a quite powerful model, which needs a bit more resources and more uh, input, more thinking to develop into something because that already starts, you, we, we, it was really simple. I mean, we started with everyone put their uh, technology they are carrying with them on the table. So what phone do you have? What computer do we have? Why do you use this? Why do you use an apple? Why do you not use this? Why do you have this one? And then start to, because because we often use things we did not even think about why we have it. You know, we just have it because because we have it. You know, and what we have it, and and that was so interesting because there is so much. I mean, <laughs> in all the workshop, people had like big philosophies behind them. You know, why they have this, or not all, but some, you know, a lot of consideration and research and exactly this one thing and not another. And, and it was hilarious. I mean, it was really, and I was, I could really imagine this kind of re realization of the structural problems we all have. I mean, basically, if you have a mobile phone, you have the choice between iOS and Android and not much more. And, um, so, you know, what means the what what means the one? What might, what what does the other mean? And and what hardware? And what tricks? And you know what? I mean, you know, who throws away here? Who always needs the latest model? Who tries to repair something? And this attitude towards things. I mean, that there's a lot of potential in which again I see starting in in the personal experience because we all have personal experiences with tech, with this technology on a daily basis, you know, with Zoom, we all hate Zoom, but it works best. So we use it <laughs> like Netflix. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, that's so true. Um, let's see, I don't know if Olga wants to take off. <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking at whether we have any questions. And if not, maybe I uh, can just say something and we draw to close maybe, but you know, I was just, um, maybe I'm naive, but I was studying data analytics for my the project I'm doing and um, looking into how a lot of things actually work, I just realized, and this is not to diminish, you know, the concerns or the political urgency of the, of the problems around huge platforms and monopolization and surveillance but what struck me is that a lot of it is actually um, a bullshit that's designed as hype specifically to raise the value of shares of these companies mm -hmm. you know like you look at certain announcements of like the new big language models and um and people are writing that oh they are like now this model is writing text that's indistinguishable from a human writing text and you actually look into it and it's not at all <laughs> indistinguishable <laughs> and then you just think okay well 
how like it doesn't a lot of things don't work at all and um the part of the of the idea that we are like this surrounded and enclosed in these technologies actually where if we keep believing this it just raises mm -hmm. the value of these corporations and in fact you can also say well a lot of this is hit and miss no one knows anything and it's it's all like also a narrative that you can um fight with by creating other narratives like how mm -hmm. much of this is i mean obviously there are like real real problems and horrors and the whole idea of drone uh, warfare which is based on certain kind of interpretation of data and then killing people remotely and i mean i don't deny the kind of massive shifts and massive problems in that but it's also like some kind of smooth narrative that's woven by these corporations that uh, that then makes us feel that we're all caught in this web and i don't actually think we are uh, frankly like you know to that extent that they want us to believe that we are all mm -hmm. um, you know um, our personalities are so transparent to them no i, I don't think any recommendation of mm. it actually works so um it's just to to make but to sell products that they say it works that we are all you know uh foretold and that's it i i just think mm. it's not true yeah i i think i know what you mean and of course this whole startup culture is selling on us a lot of bullshit you know and most recent really this <laughs> anyway we don't need to go into detail with that but i think at the same time for me of course we all all, all for, for a long time we had this kind of feeling that uh, we don't know exactly because our data travel long ways, you know, and you don't know exactly who can have access to at least the metadata that are being uh, produced on the way and things like that. I think for me, a crucial point was really um, the revelations of Edward Snowden, who kind of showed us how what kind of data are being collected. Um, of of by whom and of, of what people and what kind of data and what they are able to do with that you know and that this is beyond all uh, laws that exist it's totally illegal and also how much um, corporations work together with uh, uh, with secret services and governments and things like that you know uh, so I think we need to be realistic I think there is a lot going on and probably what you're saying you know this uh these products that all these startups are trying to sell us <laughs> yeah I think that's a it's a good idea to create a counter narrative to that you know say bullshit it's not working you know and I mean you just need to look at media art <laughs> half of it is also not working so <laughs> <laughs> it comes from the same uh, same spirit, but I I would not uh, I would not t t totally turn away from from this you know awareness that there is a lot of control happening. I mean simply the fact you know that my phone is lying here, uh, people you know uh, some people who have access to that they know where my phone is. They don't know where I am, but they know where my phone is. So that phones are being surveyed has been uh, used to. Um, to, to, to control if people stay at home during Corona or not and, and things like that. So I don't know. I think it's, 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 it's probably good and it's, uh, it's very healthy to, to, um, to, re to relativize this, what you're trying to do, Olga. I think it's good. It, may, it gives, it's also a feeling of empowerment. I think it's very important that we don't uh, drown in this, but um, at the same time, I think it's very, uh, we should know that there's a lot of evil stuff going on, you know. That's a perfect uh, note to end on. <laughs> I don't know if it's the perfect Very <laughs> Russian. <laughs> yeah. I think we need to go back to changing the world. I feel like that was a little bit more optimistic as a, as a message that, you know. Yeah, but we, yeah, Ma, you can just start changing your own world, you know, and then you start changing you know there, there we go <laughs> <laughs> from start from inside to outside <laughs> yeah right well thank you so much cornelia and thank you everyone for joining